Namaskar, welcome to Big P Guru's Prime Time, and it is my honor and pleasure to have the company of Dr. Tathagat Roy. Dr. Roy, Namaskar, and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar, Namaskar. Sir, congratulations first of all for a very well-earned victory in the recently concluded Bihar elections, and as part of the Thanksgiving speech, uh, Prime Minister Modi mentioned that Bengal is next in his sights. What do you make of this statement, sir? I'm sorry to jump straight into the topic because there is so much to cover. I'd like us to talk a little bit about uh, uh, this and then, you know, see how things go from here. Absolutely right. See, Prime Minister Modi meant what he said. That is to say, in one sense, Bihar, Bengal is Bengal. That is West Bengal is right next to Bihar, and in another sense, Bengal is the next stop. That is to say, right after the Bihar elections, there are going to be the Bengal elections. But Bengal elections are going to be additionally significant. Why? Because this was always perceived to be a leftist state, totally opposed to BJP. And now people are surprised. In fact, Bengalis themselves are surprised as to how they came over to support the BJP. But then there it is. So we have to bring that support into the ballot box, and we have to form the BJP government, and that is what uh, Prime Minister Modi talked about. So, sir, um, recently, Home Minister and ex-president of the party, Sri Amit Shah, spent two days in Bengal, and he expressed the hope that the BJP hopes to secure 200 seats in Bengal. What do you make of it, sir? Do you think that is realistic, or if not, why is it not? I think it is quite realistic, provided we get our act together. You see, that is what is most important. It is not enough to have public support. It is also necessary to show the public as to what we are going to do to come to power and what we are going to do after we come to power. Now, what we are going to do to come to power is the primary, is the, is the first priority, and we are working hard on that. We are getting the party properly organized. We are, as I said, we are getting our act together. Uh, and uh, we have, in every political party, there are problems, internal problems all over the world. So if, for instance, the United States, they have primaries. Why? They have primaries because they can't agree on the presidential candidate. Similarly, here we have problems and we have different ways of solving them, not like not through holding of primaries. But uh, mostly uh, the inner party confabulations, talks, discussions, all these things, these processes are going on. And there's enough time and uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and more uh, importantly, Amit Shahji has uh, taken the matter in hand. And I'm quite confident that with his steward, we will suddenly uh, get to 200 seats in West Bengal, maybe more. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see, sir, how it plays out. But I have a more important question, sir. Recently, one of the ministers yeah. in the Mamata Banerjee government, Suvindu Adhikari, has been making some interesting statements. What do you make of it, sir? Do you think he might be joining, jumping ship and joining BJP? See, I am not quite sure with what Suvindu Adhikari himself makes of it. Because I, it is my impression that he is uh, testing the waters. Shubhendu Adhikari is definitely disgusted with Mamata, her leadership, and uh, 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 the uh, passing of the uh, of the baton on to his inner nephew, and all these things. The total directionless uh, nature of the party. But with all that, what he is going to do? I don't think he per himself is personally sure yet, so naturally I am also not sure. Well, uh, thanks for that clarification, sir. Now, one of the things I've noticed is across the country, whenever the BJP star starts rising in a particular state, 
there is a certain amount of jumping of ship that happens from the party that is currently in power. Witness Jyotir Aditya Sindhya, he you know he jumped ship from Congress. He got richly rewarded. He got a Rajya Sabha seat for himself. Many of his proteges have found ministerial berths in the Madhya Pradesh government. Now the question that comes in the minds of people, the karyakartas, the workers who have toiled hard for the uh, party that is BJP. What about them? Don't they deserve the benefits, the fruits of their efforts, sir? Absolutely, they do. And this is a matter in which some the, some of the karikatas are sore. But I have been at pains to explain to them that there are hiccups in the process of preparing for an election, but I'm absolutely sure, more than sure, that the central leadership of the party will take care of their interests and reward them handsomely for the uh, work that they have so far done for the party. You take my case, take my own case. I joined the party in, back in 1990 after resigning a government job. Now, I was chief engineer in the railways, I resigned it, and I joined the party. And everybody said, are you crazy? Are you mad? Are you off your rocker? BJP in West Bengal, this is a leftist state, man. What are you talking about? You, would, uh, you don't have the chance of an icicle in hell. But I said... Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. I have come here because I believe in the... But, and uh, I will continue whether the people accept it or not. And eventually the people accepted the party's ideology. Now, uh, people are going to be attracted to the party on the basis of its ideology. But at the same time, to win the election, ideology is not enough. You have to have certain other things. You have to have people manning the boots. You have to have people holding public meetings. That is more complicated now by this COVID-19 pandemic. So all these things have to be got to have, I mean, have to be sorted out. But the process is on. I'm sure the process will continue. And at the same time, I'm absolutely sure that people who had held the flag of the BJP aloft in its bad days will be duly rewarded. There is no question of anything else. Thanks for the clarification, Dr. Roy. Now, um, viewers, please bear with us. We have a bit of a challenge in terms of the video of Dr. Roy, but we, we think we have it under control now. So he's, even if it shakes a little bit, his voice is coming through clear. So please stay with us. I just wanted to put that thing out, sir. Um, Dr. Roy, uh, how do you see the politics shaping up in the upcoming elections? Do you think it is going to be a three-cornered fight? meaning like the Congress, CPIM in one, the Trinamool Congress and the BJP? Or do you think it will be a straight fight between BJP and the rest? What are your thoughts, sir? be a straight fight between Trinamool Congress and, uh, the, um, uh, and the BJP. And the Congress, the CPIM, even the MIM, that is Majlis, Ittihadul Muslimin of um, this uh, OAC. These are all going to play the part of spoilers. Because politics in West Bengal has always been polarized. It has been polarized since 1967. And uh, people will not vote for a party which has no chance in winning the election. People perceive today that the only parties who stand uh, stand to win the elections are Trinamool Congress and BJP. And people will vote for one of these two parties. People will not vote for any BJ Congress or CPM who are... Uh, in fact, if they vote for them, it will work to work out to the advantage of BJP. But still, I don't think they are going to uh, vote for BJP. BIM is a different thing altogether because BIM appeals to the fundamentalist Muslims and uh, the people who are driven by fundamentalist sentiments, uh, fundamentalist Islam, they might vote for BIM. I don't know. But whether they do or not, I, as I perceive it, 
the essential fight is going to be between uh, Trinomul Congress and the BJP. With the other parties playing the part of spoilers. Spoilers so, for uh, the other Trinomul Congress. Yes. So from the center, uh, Sri Vijay Vargiya has been involved with the Bengal state politics, looking at uh, the organization, getting things lined. How satisfied are you with the efforts and progress of the BJP? For one thing, I must tip my hat to the BJP for the 2019 stunning results. I mean, they could have even gotten more if not for a few dodgy results that went against them. It was a stunning, stunning result. So, how much do you think is the ground game in place today? You see, it is, uh, it is not going to be absolutely plain sailing. As I said, we have to get our act together, we have to work hard. Now, immediately after our win in the parliamentary elections, in which we got an unprecedented 18 seats, we also got to remember that we lost three by-elections. And among those three by-elections were the constituencies where we had won earlier with a handsome majority. Now we have to analyze why exactly we have got we lost those two by three by-elections, and we've got to uh, work for work to set the thing right. We've got to learn our real lessons and put those the put that learning to work because uh, um, everything in politics. Uh, gives some direction, some idea, some uh, pointer. So we'll have to do that. We'll also have to unify the party. We'll have to make sure that there are no dissenting uh, voices, that there are no other problems. Uh, Sri Bhavarghi is doing all right. He is a very experienced politician. He has been in politics in Madhya Pradesh for a very long time. Uh, what I would particularly like to uh, impress upon him is that um, statements in West Bengal are better given in Bengali. Even if uh, Vijayavarkya Ji tries to speak a little bit of Bengali, however might which in Bengali it may be, it will create a huge impression on the people. So it is most important that he speaks Bengali. Whoever gives press statements, gives Bengali, speaks Bengali, except because the, uh, you see, as a people, we are extremely fond of our, extremely proud of our language. The country of Bangladesh was founded on the language, you can see. So it is most important that we speak the language, and uh, I'm sure uh, Kalashi will uh, make an effort to that direction. I have already told him about it. Sir, if you have to take a wild guess as to how much Sanskrit is in Bengali, what would that number be, sir? Oh, it's very difficult to say. I am not a grammarian or a linguist, but I would say um, more than 50% of uh, uh, Bengali is Sanskrit. You see, certain other languages are possibly more Sanskrit. Say, for instance, Marathi. I think Marathi is more Sanskritized. Odia, I think, is more Sanskritized. But Bengal is also pretty much Sanskritized. There have been, over the years, into the insertion of Persian words, Arabic words, English words. In fact, Bengalis tend to use English words more than uh, Hindi speakers do. But even so, the predominance, the preponderance of Sanskrit is sort of all-pervading in Bengali language. That's good to know, sir. I mean, uh, if I have to think of a tagline, speak Bengali, think Desi would be a good one. Um, after all, there is, uh, there is the border tensions that are you know, flaring up on the other side. But it will not take much time for it to start showing its, uh, rearing its ugly head on, uh, on Bengal's borders also. Sir, I find an interesting observation from the president of the BJP party, Sri J.P. Nadda, where he brought up the issue of CAA. How much of a factor do you think CAA will play in the West Bengal Assembly elections? In fact, CAA has not been canvassed to the Bengali population of West Bengal 
to the extent it should have been. You see, the CAA, that is the Citizenship Amendment Act. So no other people have been greater beneficiaries of the CAA over the years. See, since 1947 or even before 1947, there has been an exodus of Bengali Hindus from the landmark that is today known as Bangladesh into West Bengal. And this is continuing. This had continued in great, uh, uh, great um, torrents at the time of the, uh, when it was East Pakistan, and even after Bangladesh came into being, it has been going on. Now, uh, what is at the back of it? What is at the back of it is Islamic persecution in East Pakistan, which has now turned Bangladesh. And from time to time, we hear noises that people from Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh will eventually uh, lose all its Hindu population. It was 29% according to the 1941 census. Now it has come down to less than 9%. So you can imagine the number of Bangladeshi Hindus that have left, particularly the intellectual classes, totally left Bangladesh. Today, the Hindu population in Bangladesh is, consists entirely of uh, the uh, depressed classes mostly cultivators and fishermen and a handful of professionals in cities like Dhaka and Kulda, Chittagong and uh, like that. So we have got to bring, uh, no, Mahmoud, uh, 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 I jumped the gun. What had happened is that until 1971, all the people who came from East Pakistan to India, they were of automatically be given citizenship. But after 1971, there was a circular executive order from the Ministry of Home Affairs, which said that uh, uh, Hindus coming in will eventually go back, so they are not to be given citizenship. Now, this created a huge problem because the Hindus kept on coming in. Islamic persecution continued in Bangladesh, but pretended Bangladesh pretended and our Congress governments also pretended that it was not happening. As a result, people were coming, but they were not getting citizenship, which is an extremely anomalous situation and dangerous for them because the sword of uh, uh, deportation was hanging on their heads. CAA has withdrawn that sword of deportation from their heads, which is why CAA's beneficiaries are the Bengali Hindus. This has got to be brought home. This has got to be. Uh, this has got to be publicized. I am sorry to say that this is not being done to the extent it is necessary. Also, the nitty gritties of the CAA have got to be um, worked out. The, as they say, the framing of rules pursuant to the passing of an act. They've all, all also got to be done. But subject to this being done, CA is going to have a very um, important role in bringing Bengali Hindus to vote for the Arati Janta Party. Dr. Rai, I'm trying to understand the Bengali mindset, sir. When I say Bengali mindset, I'm not limiting myself to just West Bengal, but also to Bangladesh. Now, if you look at the recent happenings, there are lots of attacks happening on Hindus, physical, sometimes on uh, social media also. An innocent remark by a cricketer, you know, sparks so much abuse on him and he's forced to retract it. I mean, this freedom of expression of religion, practice of religion, this wasn't the Bangladesh we liberated in 1971. What has been happening in Bangladesh? What is the root cause of this? In fact, Bangladesh is now supposed to be enjoying a fair amount of growth, one of the fastest growing nations in that area. And yet we see all this venom being spewed. Don't they understand that this will polarize the vote in West Bengal? And also, it will also make the positions hardened in terms of what India needs to do. So what are your thoughts on that, sir? You see, when you talk about the Bengali mindset, 
you make a mistake that the Bengali mindset is uniform right through. Bengalis, that is people who speak the Bengali language, are vertically divided into two groups, two religious, ethno-religious, who constitute 70% of the Bengali speakers. And Bengali Hindus who constitute merely less than 30% of the Bengali speakers. Now, the mindset of the two sets of people are very, very different. You must understand this is very important to understand. For anyone who's trying to understand the, the political uh, history, the politics of uh, Bengal, uh, Bangladesh, West Bengal, it's very important to understand. Bengali Hindu, Bengali Muslims look upon, uh, let me put it this way, that Bengali Muslims are extremely Bengali. They are very fond of their language. But you must not forget they are also extremely Muslim. They are far, they are equally fond of Islam. Of Islam. And Islam has as much hold on them as the, uh, uh, as the Bengali language. Now, there again, there are fine differences. Among the Bengali Muslims, there are three sets of people. First, who are primarily Bengalis and secondarily Muslims. These people consider the people of West Bengal to be their sole brothers. Secondly, there are the people who are primarily Muslim, secondarily Bengali. They consider Pakistanis, Arabs, to be their brothers and West, uh, the people of West Bengal to be a distant cousin, no more than that. And third category, which is very large, this third category of people, they are, they are uh, neither this way nor that way. But if, when, when there are cases of persecution of Bengali Hindus, I'm very sorry to say when there are persecution of Bengali Hindus, in Bangladesh, they are not loath to take advantage of it. They won't fight. They won't take up cudgels on behalf of the Bengali Hindus. The first category of people will, but not the third category of people. Second category, of course, would be doing the persecution. So this is the state of the Bengali Muslims. As opposed to that, on Bengali Hindus, the hold of religion is minimal. Minimal. Actually, it has strengthened a little bit since the 1980s after the Ram Janabhumi movement and the realization that Bengali Hindus have been terribly persecuted by the Bengali Muslims, but it still um, has, uh, it will take a lot of time to take root. So among Bengali Hindus, there is a sort of a fabulous, you know, love for all Bengali speakers and they think that for everyone, the Bengali language is the supreme thing. This is an unrealistic state of being. This is the, 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 uh, the uh, mindset, as you said, in a microcosm uh, can be explained in this way. I am sorry, I can't, I mean, there are a lot of nuances among them. I can't explain this in this uh, short time, but uh, there it is. The, uh, particularly the hold of leftism, a particular variety of leftism called Beng which I call Bengal leftism, that is Bengali leftism, is enormous on Bengali Hindus, practically absent on Bengali Muslims. These nuances are required to be understood to understand the Bengali mindset. Sir, um, we are getting a little deeper because I want to understand the, the, the transformation of Bengal. You see, when the British set foot, Kolkata was the capital or Calcutta in that at that time. I think my That's interpretation right. it is Kaligat. Kaligat, you know, city evolved around that and that became. I don't know. I could be wrong about this. That's okay, sir. My question, sir, is from that time when Bengal was where all the companies established their headquarters to the present day, there has been a steady slippage. You can say that the communists did a lot of harm. But even before that, during the last, uh, you know, uh, chief ministers from Congress, like Siddhartha Shankar Roy and others, I think there was a steady decline in terms of what Bengal saw itself as an industrial base of the country. Where do you think things went wrong, sir? Oh, things went wrong in a lot of ways. 
first thing we suffered terribly as a result of partition we suffered possibly 10 times times as much as the punjabi suffered because in the case of punjab between west punjab and east punjab there was a total exchange of population all the hindus and sikhs from pakistani punjab came over to india all the muslims from indian punjab barring a few places like malher kotla and all that they went over to pakistani punjab so there was a total exchange of population the punjabis who were coming over the hindus and sikhs who were coming over from pakistan they got the they got the land the properties the assets that the muslims had left in india in bengal it was in unidirectional movement only the hindus moved from east bengal to west bengal there was no reciprocal movement from west bengal to east bengal that is number one Number two is in Bengal there was a um, uh, uh, there was a positive refusal on the part of Jawaharlal Nehru, and very sadly Sardar Patel was ailing at that time and Sardar Patel died very soon. Uh, there was a positive refusal to rehabilitate the Bengali Hindus who were coming over from East Bengal because Nehru believed in his in his own fuzzy was he way. That these Bengali Hindus will go back to East Pakistan, and why were they, would they go back? Because he had inked a totally stupid pact with Sarwardi. Now there are uh, there's a background to that which I don't have time to explain, but that is what the, that is the first problem. Bengali Hindus came over in an unidirection, unidirectional movement from East Bengal and they were not rehabilitated properly as the Punjabi Hindus and Sikhs were on the western border. That is number one. Number two is, see the cultural and uh, literary field in Bengal had been left wide open by the Congress. They did, in you know, the politics, the scene of Bengal, scene of West Bengal since the 19, the scene of the whole of Bengal, 1930s, had been dominated by two parties, or rather three parties, uh, Congress, the Muslim League, and a third party called the Krishak Majdur Praja Party, which was headed by a person called Fazlul Haq. Now, the third party died a natural death sometime around 47. All Muslims went over to Muslim League, and in 1947, the uh, Pakistan was formed, so the Muslim League went to Pakistan, and the uh, the Congress was the only uh, viable um, uh, force in West Bengal. Now, Congress did politics all right, but they left the literary and cultural field to totally the communists, and the communists got a walkover in this field, and they uh, worked in it to change the mindset of the people in a way which had been terribly detrimental to the development of the state. What they had done is they had inculcated a sort of, uh, you know, anti-prosperity. Anti-prosperity thing, it uh, might sound very uh, awful, uh, but uh, there it is. Anti-prosperity. They glory. They were glorifying poverty. They were glorifying squalor. Now you can imagine when a party glorifies proper poverty or squalor, what future does it hold for the people where this such a party is working? So that is one of the reasons. And they had also played on a Bengali, unfortunate Bengali tendency to. Disorder, and this disorder became a part of the political scene in the 1950s, intensified in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Only in 1980, it began. 80s, it began to reverse. But meanwhile, the damage was done. The um, uh, the state of West Bengal, which was industrially most advanced in the whole country. They perceived that there was no point in sticking on here when the rest of the rest of India was looking forward while this country, this part of the state was looking at chaos, looking at squalor, looking at poverty and 
um, uh, canvassing these things as a desirable state of affairs, there is no point in sticking over here, so they all left. This is um, putting it in a nutshell, a pretty big nutshell, I'd say. <laughs> uh, uh, how Bengal, the scene in, economic scene in Bengal deteriorated. It happened in front of my eyes. So I and I can uh, I can um, uh, recall it with, with, uh, as a as a first person account. Sir, um, let's just now look at the main thing about this election. TMC has has been in power for two terms, so there is going to be a certain amount of anti incumbency factor, and Mamta Didi can only rely so much on the Muslim vote bank to get her home. Now, if AIMIM, which has tasted success fighting by itself in Bihar, they won five seats. Five seats is pretty impressive, if you ask me, for a Hyderabadi Shia-based party. Uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, uh, Mr. Asaduddin Oasi, a good friend, I mean, I guess uh, we haven't met in person, but I've always told him he has a, a hangout opportunity here to explain his viewpoint. And he's definitely had success. He has found uh, success in Maharashtra, Bihar, and perhaps he might go it alone in West Bengal also. Now, the question for you, sir, is what is the thing that Mamta Didi needs to do to come back to power? Because if you know that, then you know what you need to do to come to power. See, what she has gone to, got to do is first, she wants to bag the entire Muslim vote, which is around 30% of the state. And secondly, in addition to the Muslim vote, if she can get hold of say 10, 15 percent of the Hindu vote, then she's home. So that is what she needs to do. And in order to get the Muslim vote, she won't have to work very hard. She has been working very hard for all these years, trying to give uh, government largest to uh, imams pretending to be a Muslim and uh, pretend, offering namaz with a couple of uh, her uh, acolytes where in Islam offering namaz, men and women offering namaz is strictly forbidden, but she did it. Then uh, pretending to keep Rosa and breaking the Rosa at sundown during Ramzan, all these things she has been doing and she has been trying to humor the Muslim vote. Possibly she will get the Muslim vote, except to the extent Mim can get a bite into it. And then after that, she, after all, she has a share of the Hindu vote. Some people among the Hindus, they feel that they have been influenced by this left Nehruvian propaganda on the, uh, on uh, the so-called communalism. And uh, they will not vote for BJP. They will not vote for Mamta. There is also the factor to consider, very unfortunate, if BJP can't get its act together. If BJP can't get its act together, then that will also detract to some extent from the BJP support. So Mamta will have to work at all these things to win. Now, um, see, when we think about population migrating from one country to another country, in search of better economic opportunities. Once they find their feet in the new country, they are reluctant to go back. However, if you look at the current growth rate between India and Bangladesh, certainly Bangladesh is growing faster. Of course, we know that Bangladesh is perhaps one of the most densest, densely populated areas in the whole world. My question to you, sir, is, do you see a reverse migration happening from West Bengal to Bangladesh? If not, why not? I don't see any such thing happening, and you gave the answer yourself. That is to say, Bangladesh is incredibly densely populated. What is the population density of India? It is around 380 per square kilometer. Of course, there are very extreme regional variations in, in and around West Bengal. It would be 700, 800 per square kilometer. In certain parts of Rajasthan, it would be less than um, um, 100 per square kilometer. As opposed to that, in Bangladesh, it is uniformly about 1,200 per square kilometer. You can imagine. 
it is the densest populated densest populated country in the world if you leave aside city states like uh, singapore or macau or vatican city so in that density of population bengali muslims won't want to go back they might want to go to some advanced country a lot of them i mean i was surprised couple of uh, uh, some 3 years back i went to see the leaning tower of pisa in italy and while I, we were having a cup of coffee in a restaurant i heard people at my back talking bengali in the dialect of my um, forefathers that is a bangladeshi dialect my uh, ancestors are from bangladesh i heard them speaking in bangladeshi dialect so i called them and i asked them they were very happy they said that they had come with um, uh, through a lot of hardship they had come to libya they had then they had practically come in uh, tops crossing the mediterranean then they can come to italy they could speak fluent it a fluent italian now so they could go to one of these countries but i don't think they are going to go back to bangladesh besides they are having a very cushy time over here most of them have been given citizenship they have been given passports they have been given ration cards why should they go back and they will inflate the vote bank here and uh, the beneficiaries of that vote bank that is trinamool congress in, in the case of west bengal and in uh, the uh, badruddin bajmal's party in uh, assam they will welcome them to serve. they they will want them to stay on here so let's say let's say that um, caa is implemented in letter and spirit and uh, but that only gives citizenship to some it does not strip citizenship from people who illegally entered india and for whatever reason got voting card and rights now do you foresee let's let's just play it out sir i'm not going to hold you to it let us just play it out play out a scenario say bjp comes to power now just like they did in assam even though it is still an exercise in progress work in progress do you foresee an nrc version being implemented in bengal also because in my opinion it is high time it is done in fact if you ask me the entire northeast needs to have this thing because you have to have a clear cut way for somebody to come into india and be a citizen today with the technology at your disposal perhaps it is easier than perhaps uh, in 1971 what are your thoughts sir see it ought to be done as it was done in assam not only in west bengal but also in certain parts of bihar did you notice that in bihar certain places this mim has got five seats yes yes in spite of get in spite of having a much lesser percentage of votes than the uh, ljp that is this uh, chirag paswan's party they got a larger number of votes chirag paswan's party didn't get a single seat although they got a much larger percentage of votes but i uh, oasis party got a la- much larger percentage of votes because their vote bank is concentrated near the bangladesh border bihar has a uh, virtual bangladesh border it is away from the certain areas like kishanganj purnia araria forbes ganj katihar these are just uh, tens of kilometers away from the bangladesh border in fact in 1947 when the country was partitioned west bengal was in two parts and uh, the in between part the bihar, in between part bihar had a border with bangladesh then east pakistan that is then later on in 1957 when the state reorganization was done at that time uh, the tiny sliver of bihar was taken away and given to west bengal so that west bengal was not in two parts it became in one part but still you will see that there is a chicken see if you look at the map you see that there is a narrow chicken snake of west bengal between the northern part and the southern part so in that part where the bihar is very close to the bangladesh border this amim has uh, scored well and uh, that is that rings the bell uh, the alarm bell and that means that the scrutiny 
I don't, I can't know, I don't know yet how exactly that scrutiny is going to be done. But that scrutiny of the people who are apparently of Bangladeshi origin has got to be done very carefully. See, I can tell by questioning a person whether he was uh, born in Bangladesh or uh, whether he was born in West Bengal. Certain words are absolutely different. Particularly family related. Their Bengali and our Bengali are not the same. Say, for instance, the word for the familial relationships. The word for elder sister is, we say Didi, they say Appa. For a um, uh, mother's sister, we say Mashi, they, or same as Mosi, they say Khala. Mother's sister, we say Pishi, they say Fufa. So these things, by testing a few words like this, we can find out uh, who is of Bangladeshi origin and who is not. But the problem is that there is, these have no legal validity. I can make out, but someone armed with an Indian passport can say to help with you. Um, I, I am an Indian and I shall remain in India. So uh, how that problem is going to solve, get solved, we'll have to find a way of doing it. Sir, a um, couple of questions. These are more curiosity on my part than anything else. Why is Bangladesh so densely populated? There is Is there no population control in place there? Not even any kind of... a uh, initiative to say that, you know, uh, you should try and plan your families. What is the average size of a family, sir? So, average size of family, I am not sure in Bangladesh, but in West Bengal, the average size of family of Muslims is much, much larger than that of Hindus. And there is a reason for it. There are religious instructions upon Muslims from Molanas uh, inflate the size of the family so that they can take over the whole world. They, um, uh, they say that the America and Russia, they have got the atom bomb, but we've got the population bomb. We will swarm the, the whole world with our population. They do it. They do it consciously. I've got a book in Bengali, in uh, my possession which is written by Mola, Molana Abdul Alamodudi, who was the founder of the um, uh, Jamaat-e Islami. He had clearly said that population control, family planning, all these things, are, these are anathema to Islam. These are not permitted, to, permitted in Islam. You must have as many children as Allah gives you. And, uh, well, that is the reason why you have this kind of population in Bangladesh. I must say, to do justice, that Bangladesh, at the government level, they are trying their best to uh, scale it down, to uh, control the population, but it's so far been successful to have only a limited extent. Um, so, in, in a nutshell, sir, what would be your advice to the party uh, like one or two steps or one, two, three that they need to do to win in West Bengal for sure. If you have to just say say three things that the BJP needs to do to win in uh, Bengal, what would those be, sir? The first thing, we've got to identify the issues. One of the issues is that this West Bengal is not like any other state. How was West Bengal created? It was created by Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee as a homeland for Bengali Hindus because the total state of Bengal was Muslim majority and Jinnah claimed it as a Muslim majority state for the whole of Pakistan. It would not only have given him the whole state, but it would have separated the Northeast from the rest of India. The Northeast would have also come to India, gone to Pakistan. It is only through the foresight and the effort of Dr. Shamprasad Mukherjee that this was changed. Now, this is a thing that the, Bengali, the Hindu superiority, Hindu numerical superiority in West Bengal has got to be kept. If it is gone, it is already pretty near going. If it is gone, then Hindus have had it. Very recently, I think day before yesterday, I got a meme. And I have put it on Twitter, which 
describes an imaginary scene in which in 2050, a Bengali Hindu father and uh, his son, infant son, a young son, they are sitting on a bench in Jharkhand and the son is asking the father about what we had in West Bengal, West Bengal. And the father is saying, you know, son, uh, these our uh, neighbors, Karim Chacha, they were very so sorry about our going away. They came all the way to the border to see us off, but they didn't try to keep us back. That is the part which is left unseen. So this is the part, this is one of the things that have got to be um, hammered to the people. Then the economic degeneration of the state, which was largely done by the leftists and also by Mamata. Because you see, Mamata Banerjee does not have any ideology. She does not have any program. She had been blindly copying the leftists because she figured that the leftists have been in power in the state in 30, for 34 years. So the method that they have followed, followed, we might as well follow the same method. And that is how she has been uh, perpetuating or she has been trying to perpetuate her rule. But if this is done, this is one of the ways of doing it is Kunda Raj and um, disorder, uh, law and order problems. Now, if this sort of thing is done, then uh, no industrialist will touch this state with a 10-foot pole. Even otherwise, they will not touch it with a 10-foot pole because... An industrialist like Tata, someone like Tata, was driven away from the state of West Bengal by a chief minister. Can you imagine that? That when all the chief ministers all over India, they try to attract industries into their state, we are living in a state where the chief minister had driven out a, a group like Tata and was taken, taking pride on it. Now that land is lying fallow, nothing will grow over there. And uh, she has, of course, forgotten all about it. So these are things, these are two of the things that must be brought home to the people. Besides, it's extremely corrupt. The West Bengal administration is extremely corrupt and partisan. We ought to tell the people that we want to bring back the rule of law, not the rule of the party that the CPM and the Trinobol have been following. We want to bring back the rule of law. You see, the people, the people who are who would, like, who would like to invest in West Bengal, they would like to see the rule of law. They wouldn't like to see the rule of the party that is going on in West Bengal. We must tell the people about this. Sir, um, my last question for today: um, If uh, the C, it is. This is just again analysis of the 2019 results. A lot of CPIM supporters allegedly voted for BJP because there was a perception that the future for Hindus in Bengal is very uncertain under TMC. So they also saw this thing. Do you see that thing play out again in the next elections? Uh, and uh, would that be a deciding factor, sir? It should be provided BJP plays its cards properly. Provided BJP canvasses that point, it's an extremely important point, as I have just now said. That's the three important things, like number one is the change in the, the um, uh, balance of population, demographic balance. Number two, the economic degeneration of the state. And number three is um, uh, corruption and... Uh, Partisan administration and uh, substitution of rule of law by uh, the rule of party. These things have got to be brought home to the people. But among these, I think this uh, matter of change in the demographic balance is one of the most important and it has got to be brought home to the people properly. Thank you very much, sir. It has been a pleasure talking to you and we'll be back uh, to talk to you some more as the elections come closer so that we can hear your vision for the state. And it's been uh, 
very, very eye-opening. Uh, there are lots of things that we covered today that we have not covered in the past. And it's always a pleasure to talk to a person as erudite as you, sir. Dr. Roy, thank you very much for joining P Guru's channel. And Namaskar, and hope to see you again. Namaskar, Sri.